Good morning, Freedom Family. Yes, it's Brother Willie again. Haven't seen you in a while. I, I missed you a whole lot. Well, Brother Eric, thank you for this opportunity to get a chance to speak to our wonderful family once again. And uh, wow, what a ride. Who ever thought that I would be sitting in my garage uh, doing the offering? <laughs> what an honor. I just want to thank everyone for all your prayers and uh, thank you for the Freedom Family. Today, I just wanted to get a chance to remind uh, the family on giving and how important that is to what we're still trying to accomplish at Freedom Bible Church. I have in my notes just a couple of ways that we can give. Number one, giving online. We can simply go to freedombiblechurch.net forward slash give. That's an easy and secure way to give. Also, there's text to give. You can simply text your gift to 84321. The third way, we can do bill pay. You can use the bill pay function through your online banking account. And finally, if you prefer, you can just mail your checks in to Willie, uh, 777 Blanchard Road, Evans, Georgia, 30809. Or you can just drop it off at the church. Well, that's all I have for today. And be blessed and look forward to seeing everyone soon. Bye -bye. Good morning, Freedom, and welcome to our church online service. Before we go ahead and get started with our worship service, uh, we just want to take this time to do some directed prayer as we prepare our hearts, um, not only for the worship, but also to be able to um, really take as much as we can um, from what the Lord is saying through Pastor Eric. Um, so what we're going to go ahead and do is we're just going to um, take some time in silence, really prepare our own hearts, um, but then we're also going to go ahead and do some directed praying towards um, maybe our families, ourselves, um, and our community around us. Um, so before we go ahead and get started, I'm super excited um, to be able to um, just share part of the passage that we're going to be going through today, um, and it's in Philippians 2, um, and it talks about this idea um, of working out our salvation through fear and trembling. And when I think about fear and trembling, I really think about the magnitude and, and being in awe of who God is. Um, and so I did just want to share a quick story of, of, you know, growing up and living in Germany, I had so many great opportunities to be able to um, just be in nature. And um, one of my favorite things was to be able to go to the mountains. And so there's one point where we would go to these mountains in Switzerland and um, as I just gazed at these mountains, I you know, really took a lot of time to just think about, wow, like God actually created these things. Like, like to think about the magnitude of, of, of who God is and how majestic he is, how big he is. Um, it really just shined a light on, on how amazing it is for him to want to have a personal relationship with me, even though he is such a big God. Um, and so what we're going to go ahead and do is actually take a moment just to be in silence and really reflect on some of our experiences that we've had personally with the Lord, um, seeing different ways that, that he has really revealed himself to us um, and really shown how big and how, um, how all-knowing he is um, despite anything that might be going on around us. And so we're just going to take a minute or so to um, really just reflect on our Lord and Savior. So I actually want to go ahead and share um, a verse that I actually was reading today um, and really just um, to take this time to, to give thanks to the Lord. Um, and it's in Psalm 9 and it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is just take this time to give thanks um, to, to God for 
for all that he's done, for the experiences that we have personally gotten to have with him, um, but also for what he's doing um, in and through our community. And so um, let's just go ahead and take this time to, to pray over that. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you have made a way, God, for us to have intimacy with you. God, thank you that you sent Jesus, God, not only to die for our sins, God, and forgive us, but you also made a way, God, for us to have a personal relationship with you. And so, God, I pray that as we go into church and as we as we celebrate you, God, each and every Sunday, God, would we be reminded, God, that through each day, we have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. God, to think about how you created everything here on earth. God, you created the mountains and the waters and, and all the living creatures, God, here on earth. You have also created a way for us to experience you personally. And so, Father, I pray in this time, God, as we go into your scriptures, God, as we go into singing to you, Father, God, would we be reminded, God, that, that you are not only our heavenly Father, God, but you, you through Jesus, God, are our friend. And God, we, we want to enjoy time with, God, with you, God. We want to spend time really getting to know you personally, God. And so, Lord, would you enlighten our hearts, God, to be able to experience you. God, would we not just um, find this Sunday to be a number, normal Sunday, God, where we sit and just hear a message and, and just continue on with our Sunday, Lord, but would we really gaze upon your beauty, God? Would we find joy in your presence, God? And Lord, would we see you above all things? We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So one last thing that I wanted to share before we go ahead and start the service is I just feel like the Lord is just... Um, leading not only myself, but I believe our church, um, to really embrace um, our personal relationships with Jesus. Um, I think that, that God has given us such a great opportunity for us to be able to spend time with him personally this week before um, we get to come back together. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just amazed on how God has continued to create opportunities for us. And I think um, that this can honestly be an opportunity for us to really experience him personally this week. Um, and so I just wanted to encourage you guys and we're gonna take another moment to pray and um, just allow this time to be a good time for us this week to um, really dwell in his presence, um, really experience him personally so that our communities will be affected by it. Because I, I realized a lot this week and we actually talked about this um, in, in an, our, or with our students on Wednesday is the more that we've seen the love of the Lord, the more that we want to love others. And so I've just seen God move in so many different ways and I've started to embrace a new love for the Lord. And um, it really just made me think, man, what would it look like for our church to just love the Lord so much that our community would be able to see it? And so we're just going to go ahead and take this time um, to pray before we go ahead and start the service and let's just come to him with thankful hearts um, and with a love that that only is found in Jesus because it is through him that he died for us it is through him that we have been not only forgiven of sins but we have also um, been called children of God 
So let's just go ahead and take this time to pray. God, we love you. We thank you so much for your truth. God, we thank you so much for the fact that your word is alive. God, and that it enables us to have this relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray that, that we as a congregation, that we as a church, as, as a family, God, that we just embrace your love. God, that we hold tight to you to your loving words, God, to the grace that you continue to show us each and every day. And Father, would we look upon our salvation, God, as only um, something that has been granted by you because it is through your blood that we have been washed clean. And so, Father, I love you. God, we love you. Lord, I know that you're gonna do some amazing things today in this service and so God I'm just I'm excited I'm excited and I'm expecting God for you to just move in our hearts so that we can see you more than we have before God we love you and it's in your precious and holy name that we pray amen
You know, life is full of expectations. Parents have expectations of their children. Children have expectations of their parents. Husbands have expectations of their wives. Wives, of course, have expectations of their husbands. Employers and employees expect certain things at work. Let's be honest, you have expectations of me as your pastor. And I have certain expectations of you as members of this church. However, when we truly boil it down, the expectations that we have for one another are really nothing more than holding people to our standards. But did you know that God has expectations? You see, much of this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi was written to point out God's expectations for his church. Now, the church in Philippi was a great church. It was the first Christian church established in Europe. It had been founded by the Apostle Paul 10 years earlier. Now, this church had proven to be an incredible blessing to Paul while he was in prison in Rome. And Paul makes it abundantly clear that Christ was the center of Paul's life. And he's showing the Philippians that God expects Jesus to be the center of our lives as well. Paul summed up the entire Christian life in one verse. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Then in chapter 2, Paul gives us this pattern for Christian living. In Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, which we looked at a few weeks ago, Paul calls us as followers of Christ to self-denial, humility, unity, and to this other's first approach to life. Then in verses 5 through 11, Paul shows us this perfect example in Jesus. And in today's passage, Paul gives us this process of how you and I can become more Christ-like in our daily lives. Philippians 2, 12 through 18, which we're going to look at today, teaches us a lot about Christian discipleship. It teaches us a ton about God's expectations of His followers. You see, God expects us to live like Jesus. He expects us to walk in humility, to walk in obedience, and to put others first. Now, while it may not seem fair for us to impose expectations upon one another, God has every right to expect anything that He wants from us. After all, He has gone to great lengths to save us and to reconcile us to Himself. God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to shed His blood on the cross in order to redeem us. And as we walk through this passage, I want you to notice three connections that the Apostle Paul makes. First of all, he's going to connect God's work and our work in verses 12 and 13. Then in verses 14 and 15, he's going to connect This idea of avoiding grumbling with shining as lights in the world. And then in verses 16 and 8 through 18, he's going to connect sacrifice with rejoicing. Listen to what he says in verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. That word, therefore, is pointing back to Jesus, His incarnation, because Jesus is the perfect example of humility and obedience. Just as He was obedient to the Father's will, you and I are called to be obedient to Jesus as well. See, the Christian faith, Paul will teach us, stands on two foundations— Trust and obedience. James calls it faith and works. If you ever need a reason to surrender your will to the will of God in your life, then look no further than Jesus, who gave His all to do the Father's will. Now verses 12 and 13 provide us with this wonderful starting point for understanding sanctification which simply put is the lifelong obedience of believers, which leads us to grow in Christ-likeness. 
Now, this passage is not about works-based righteousness. There is absolutely nothing you and I can do to earn salvation. Paul doesn't say work for your salvation. He says work out your salvation. There's nothing you can do to cause God to love you more and nothing you've ever done that will cause God to love you less. We need to understand, though, that salvation is ours because it was first His. God planned it. God purposed it. God pursued it. God paid it. And it's God that presses it upon our hearts. Salvation becomes ours the moment we place our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. God has worked salvation for us by His grace. But Paul tells us that we're to work it out. And honestly, this verse, this verse has been misunderstood and misapplied for 2,000 years. First, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. This does not mean that we work to be saved. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. But it also doesn't mean that we work to stay saved. Once you're saved, you don't lose your salvation. Work out your salvation means to complete it, to carry it to its conclusion. What Paul is talking about is growing toward maturity. And honestly, there are hundreds of implications of of working out God's life-changing salvation in our lives. But really, what it simply means is to follow the example of Christ. Eugene Patterson or Peterson rather, calls this a long obedience in the same direction. But that's the challenge, right? We don't want a long obedience in the same direction. We live in a fast-paced, fast-food, microwave, instant gratification culture. We want to be transformed now. But sanctification is a slow process. You know, honestly, I, I believe that's why... So many Christians like camps and churches like events. Why? Because it's easy to show enthusiasm for Jesus at an event. It's easy to get excited about Jesus at a camp. But it's quite another thing to live faithfully and consistently when no one is watching. See, God has called us to day in, day out, growing in Christ-likeness. We need to develop the same passion we have for camps and events for ordinary obedience, where we day to day follow the pattern of Jesus. See, Jesus has shown us what humble, others-focused, God-glorifying obedience looks like. That's the kind of life that you and I are called to live. And here's the good news. We're not alone. Philippians 2.13, let me read it again for you. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You see, it's God working in you. Through the power of God's Holy Spirit, before we were saved, God was working on us. And now that we're saved, God works within us. God is at work in you, and He will accomplish His good purposes through you. This is so important to understand, and and unfortunately, many Christians miss out on this truth. That if you are a follower of Jesus... You are redeemed by faith plus nothing. You can't do any good works for salvation. But after you're a follower of Jesus, then God talks to you about your works. You see, the salvation that He worked in by faith is the salvation He will work out through obedience. John Calvin expressed it this way. He said, faith alone saves. But the faith that saves is not alone. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said it this way, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone, someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. It's found in James 2, verses 17 and 18. So so what does this look like? Well, I'm glad you asked because according to Paul, God's work in us is twofold, to will and to work. To will, God reveals His will to us and then He leads us into adopting His will as our own. And to work, God then empowers us to follow Him 
in obedience. You see, church, the Christian life is not passive. We don't just sit around twiddling our thumbs, waiting and watching God do all the work. No, He places within us this desire to be involved in the work. He shows us what to do, and then we go and do it. We obey. After all, that's why He saved us. In Ephesians 2.10, He said, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And look at this, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, God saved, us to, he, God saved us to work, and then God equips us for that work. So what does this look like practically? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. While it certainly means following Jesus in every single area of our life, Paul challenges us with this second connection, the connection between complaining and shining. Listen to Philippians 2, 14-16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now, let's be honest, it might surprise you like it surprises me that Paul chose avoidance of grumbling and arguing as his example for working out our salvation. Why did Paul choose those two things? I believe one obvious reason is this. Discipleship is not easy. Christian perseverance is difficult. Following Jesus isn't an easy road. Think about it. Pursuing holiness giving generously, practicing hospitality, sharing the gospel, loving your spouse, your kids, your neighbors appropriately. And all those other aspects of Christian discipleship are hard, and they can tempt us to grumble. And the temptation to complain and argue is not only a temptation personally, it is a temptation corporately as well. Remember the context of this letter. The Philippian church had some internal strife and external pressure. When we face internal strife and external pressure, it can easily lead us to complain both to God and to one another. And complaining is a temptation for anyone in a local church. And here's why. You and I can't live up to each other's expectations. At some point, you will be disappointed. Either you'll be let down by me as your pastor, you'll be let down by a ministry leader, someone in the church will upset you, a greeter won't greet you like you expect. Whatever the case may be, you will be tempted to complain. And the question is not, will you be tempted to complain? Because you will. You'll be tempted to complain by others. Why? Because complaining is the common language of our culture. And it always has been. We live in a world filled with complainers. And when you're tempted, what will you do? Will you downplay this sin as so many other people do? Will you just say, well, I'm just expressing my views. I'm just saying what I think. Or will you remember this verse? To do everything without grumbling and complaining. So a better question is this. How can you maintain joy? in the face of disappointment and discontentment. Well, once again, we have to go to the gospel. The gospel is our source of joy. The gospel tells us that we are far better off than we deserve. Considering what we deserve and what we've been given in Christ should keep us from complaining. But here's the, here's the reality. When you and I, when we lose sight of the gospel, we will easily go down that dark hole of grumbling and complaining. But that still doesn't answer the question of why this was such a big deal to Paul. And here's the reason. Because the world around us is watching. The world around us is listening to us. We claim to know God, but yet we grumble and complain. And when we do, we are no different from the world. We lose our distinctiveness. We lose our effectiveness. And Paul does not want that to happen. 
But here's what happens. By not grumbling and complaining, we stand out like bright stars in a dark sky. Paul says it will be blameless, pure, without fault. In other words, we'll be without hypocrisy. What turns people away from the church and from Christianity more than anything is hypocrisy. Think about the eternal difference we can make in someone's life when we choose to speak a language different from that of the culture. Listen, just, just go on the, the TV after church today and watch the news or check out social media and notice just how many people complain. And imagine what would happen when we, as Jesus' followers, replace grumbling and complaining with gratitude and praise. Listen, church, people will marvel at it. They will be attracted to Jesus, and that's why Paul says this is such a big deal. But then he takes it even a step further in verse 16. He explains that we should shine by holding fast to the word of life. Instead of complaining, Christians should be defending and proclaiming the word of life. Don't let go of God's word and don't stop proclaiming it in a crooked and perverse culture. And to the church in Colossae, Paul wrote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Why? So that it can permeate our hearts, spill out in praise and proclamation. We could, we could summarize this entire section in this. Paul wants the church to be a proclaiming church, not a complaining church, which leads to Paul's final connection. And it's the connection between sacrifice and rejoicing. Listen to verses 17 through 18. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. You see, church, Paul's main concern for the Philippians was that they remain faithful and fruitful. And he was willing to pour out his very life to make that happen. Just as Jesus emptied himself, Paul says that he is happy and glad to pour out his life for the advancement of the gospel and for the glory of God. In addition, Paul says that nothing should give us more joy than pouring out our lives for the sake of others and the glory of God. Our joy should be rooted in sacrificial service. Listen, God saved you and God saved me with the expectation that we would work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that we would do everything without complaining, and that we would rejoice when our lives are poured out for the sake of the gospel. But the truth is this, we can't be passive when it comes to spiritual matters. We have to be active in exercising our faith. We need to work out what God has worked in us. And that's the thrust of this entire passage. See, Christianity is so much more than just a decision to make Jesus your Savior. It is also a determination to walk with and to obey Jesus as your Lord. Now I'm going to close with this thought. Because we have one primary enemy that will keep us from walking with Jesus as our Lord. And that enemy is ourself. You see, even with Christ's example, and even with the Holy Spirit's power, living out our faith won't be easy because of self. Inside each and every one of us is a rebellious nature that will do everything it can to take control. That's why Paul said in Romans 7 that I don't do what I want to do and I do the things I don't want to do. Why? Because, it's because of himself. Let me share two things I want you to remember. And it says, make it your goal to exalt Christ, not yourself. Now granted, that's not going to be easy. But through God's power... Our hearts and our minds can learn to live for Jesus more than ourselves. That won't happen overnight, and it's going to require God mercifully and repeatedly picking us up after we stumble. But eventually, with God's enabling grace, self can be weakened and begin to lose more battles than it used to win. And the second thing is this. Conquer self's tendency to take charge. 
Self doesn't like to sit in the back seat and, and take the passenger side. No, self wants to complete control, but don't give in. This is a winnable conflict because God is working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the fact of the matter is that myself is in constant battle with you. You've called me to surrender all that I am to you. You've told me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. And really, what that means is I have to work out what you've already worked in. I didn't do anything to earn salvation. I didn't do anything to gain salvation. Yet, you work salvation in me, and my calling is to work salvation out. Father, I pray for your strength to do that. Lord, I pray for anyone that's listening to this who's who's never placed their faith in you. They've never submitted to you as Lord. They've never realized that they are saved by faith when they believe the finished work that you've done on the cross. Because salvation comes only from you. It is only by your grace. And I know many people that are probably listening this morning have been trying to work it, uh, work for their salvation. They've been trying to earn it through doing good things and being a good person and maybe even attending church and maybe even watching tons of different churches online during these days. Lord, I pray that you show them and reveal them right now that the only way, the only way that we have salvation is because of your work. It is by faith alone, in Christ alone. And it is only through your grace. And if that's you, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you simply do so right now. Romans 10 says that if, that if we will confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. My prayer for you right now is that you would confess him as Lord. Believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross, knowing that he will redeem you. And Father, for those of us who know you, we have this long obedience in the same direction called sanctification. We all want it fast. We all want it quick. We all want it now. And yet it is a day in, day out obedience. It is day in and day out trust in you that leads us to become more like you. We pray that you would give us the strength to do that, to do that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, Freedom Family, thanks again for joining us for Church Online. You know, next Sunday, July 12th, we're going to be gathering again uh, in our building and just look forward to being able to worship with you. We're going to put in even more uh, social distancing guidelines. We're going to put in some opportunities that we'll talk to you about this week that will, that will help us continue to, to work and strive for the safety of every person that attends our church. And so we're just grateful for the opportunity to do that. Look forward to seeing you on June 12th, either in person or here online, either way. Uh, but we're going to have our services at 9 and 11 a.m. Look forward to seeing you then. God bless, and we'll see you next Sunday.